Okay, so um, so some of the questions were again going back, some of the questions you just asked over the break, were again going back to the issue of defining a positive uh, definite uh, set of states that we can uh, call physical states, right? Um, so, so far, we didn't really address the problem, and if you think, uh, it seems that we made the problem worse, because we enlarged the Fox space to an entire new sector. So instead, instead of subtracting states, right, as in the naive uh, quantization we were doing, okay, you have your space and you impose constraint, like Gupta Bloiler, what we did is we enlarged the set of states that now are obtained by acting with creation operator, if you think in the operator language, related to the B and the C fields that we, we added. Right, so the question is still relevant. How do we go back to, the, uh, to, to define the physical states? Right? And the idea is to apply the BRST approach So again, I, I, I will not be uh, very detailed, but um, since uh, I, I think that you might have seen this in the QFT lecture, let me make the link. And if you want, the main message is that we are not doing anything particular special. We are just adapting a formalism that uh, is viable for the quantization of any theory with a local symmetry to the particular case of this two-dimensional theory, where the local symmetry is, of course, the one generated by the Virasoro uh, uh, generators, or if you watch equivalently, the diffeomorphism generated by T, the tensor, the stress tensor. So let me spell the thing in general, and this is uh, following very closely what the book of Polchinski does. So think about a theory where you have a set of matter fields that I call phi. Of course, in our application, this phi will be the x, right? The string coordinates. Then we saw that there is a set of ghosts right? Now, this set of ghosts, uh, let me write again B will be our B, C will be our C. So let me write again abstract indices. Right? So the index on C, I call it alpha, and this is the index of the gauge parameter. Right? So remember, conceptually, the C is a Grassmann version of the gauge parameter, the, the uh, generator of the gauge variation. Right? So that's why in our case this was uh, an object with one index up. Uh, VA is the generator was a vector and so C uh, at conformal weight minus one was a vector. Now, what is the index uh, of B? Well, this B is related to the gauge fixing condition, right? Uh, so in our case, the gauge fixing condition was taking uh, the um, uh, metric, so this is the matter will be x and h, right? It was taking the metric to take a particular form, right? So that's why this guy had two indices, b, a, b. So abstractly, Polchinski says, okay, Let's do, uh, let's have a, an index, uh, big A. This is on the gauge fixing condition. Then, abstractly, we have an action. This is the matter action. And then we have a BC action.
which takes in abstract form this version, this form, where G is the gauge fixing condition. Right. So for us, was taking uh, the uh, metric, right? So you remember this. This was what I was calling P, right? So it's, it comes from uh, uh, taking the gauge fixing or on the metric due to the diffeomorphism. Right. And then what we had here was a delta function that fixed the metric to the reference metric. And in the calculation that we did at the end, is once we calculate the stress tensor, we can take as a reference metric just the flat metric. Right. Now, it is convenient in this BRSD formulas not to do that step. Right? Not to use that delta function yet, but to rewrite that delta function again as an integral version. So we are just using delta of x is integral dp e to the ipx. Right. So basically, you take that delta function and you add it here as an extra field that I called big B and this guy has I B yeah maybe I want this to be down B A G A. And so this new field appears algebraically, so you can do the path integral explicitly, just takes this form, and you go back and you get the delta function, and G A is just the metric equal to my reference metric. So in, the, in, in gauge theory, this will be the Feynman gauge, for instance, another gauge fixing condition. Now, why is this way of writing the action interesting? This is a, an algebraic uh, observation that is very easy to check once you are given the rules. It's less obvious to write it for the first time, so that's why it took, me, it took a, a bit of time. And what people realize is that this whole thing has a new global symmetry. This global symmetry is a bit strange because it has the opposite statistic as the original gauge symmetry. So the system started as a system that had a local gauge invariance. This local gauge invariance is gauge fixed. This big G is the gauge fixing parameter. So you may think I lost all the invariances I gauge fixed. What BRST noticed is that if you write the action in this form, including this extra field, the local gauge invariance you had at the beginning provides you with a new global symmetry and that global symmetry has parameter generating the symmetry which have the opposite statistics as the original parameter of the local symmetry. So in our case for the bosonic theory the original parameter of the local symmetry was a vector, a boson so this BRST symmetry will be a fermionic symmetry. Right. And what they did is very nicely is to write for you the variation. So this delta B is how all the object appearing in this action change when I perform a variation under this new symmetry. And the idea is that on the matter field this symmetry acts 
as a gauge symmetry, right? So this delta is just the gauge variation, and you see it has the index of the gauge parameter. So in our case, it will be diffeomorphism. So if you go back in the uh, first lecture, and I repeated earlier today, you see how the metric changes under diffeomorphism, under the x changes under diffeomorphism. Okay, th that's this variation. The difference is that the gauge parameter is now the ghost. So, on the matter sector, very easy, the new BRST symmetry is nothing else than the old gauge symmetry, but the gauge parameter is identified with the ghost. So what is non-trivial is what's the action of the BRST symmetry on the remaining object, and the remaining objects are small b, small c, and big b. Now here you have small b, big b, and small c. So the most complicated one is this one. So epsilon is just a, 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 a bookkeeping device that tells me that I did one variation. If you wish, you can think about this epsilon as a fermionic parameter, so as to make these statistics all bosonic. Fermionic, fermionic, bosonic. Right. This is just a bookkeeping device, it's telling me I did one variation. Right. The most complicated bit is this one. And here, you use in an essential way that the original gauge symmetry had an algebra, right? In our case, it will be the Virasoro algebra. And that algebra closes with uh, some structure constant. So this F alpha beta gamma are the structure constant of what happens when you do one diffeomorphism, another diffeomorphism, and you do the commutation relation. That's a new diffeomorphism. And these are the structure constant that appears. Now, you notice that here I am assuming that uh, these are standard structure constant, and for instance, they will satisfy the Jacobi identity. Right. So this will come back. This is one assumption of the BRST uh, construction, is that you have a gauge symmetry, and the algebra of this gauge symmetry satisfies, is a standard algebra, if you do the Jacobi identities, they are fine. Then this is, oh, this one half is non-trivial, right? It has to be there. This is simply zero. And this is, if my convention are correct, yeah, because of this i, minus i epsilon b a. So this is what BRST tell you that uh, under this transformation, this action is unchanged. Now, you can see that, so, so this is, uh, um, requires a bit of work, right? It's, it's not immediate. So I will not do it. Let me just give you the hints if you want to fill the details. So one way of seeing that is to com combine these two terms to combine these two terms, right? And then you can rewrite these two terms as the variation of B A G A minus. So let me just do the easy bit. The variation, you apply in the standard chain rule. So the variation of the first times the second. 
The variation of the BA is small b is this one, right? And so you see that you get I big B times G is exactly this term. So one of the key ingredients is that with these rules, you can combine, so in key ingredient number one, combine the non-matter fields and here I introduce just a bit of jargon that you see you, you see often into a Q a BRST exact term we'll see more of this so this is just a fancy way of saying that this bit, the non-matter part, is the BRST variation of something. Is a total derivative, if you want. Second ingredient, DBRST, so this variation, squares to zero. And you can check that field by field, right? You can take, let me do just the easy one. You can take d square b of small b. Then this is this, right? The variation of small b is big B. And the variation of big B is zero. Right, so this is the easy one. Right, the difficult one is this one. Right, because you see the variation of first C is quadratic, and then you have to do the variation of the first, the variation of the second, right? So you get a combination of things. That combination, if you look at it, certainly something that doesn't look to be zero, is zero thanks to the hypothesis that this F satisfies the Jacobi identity. So there is where you touch explicitly the fact that you need uh, 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 algebra uh, that satisfies the Jacobi identity to get this condition. Now, if you think a bit, the algebra we have is the algebra of our symmetry, is the Virasoro algebra the one that we discussed at the beginning of today. Now, that algebra is standard, satisfies the Jacobi identity, only if the anomaly term C is zero. Right. Is, if C is zero, then you have Lm, Ln equal M minus N, those will be the structure constant of Lm plus N. But in general, if we are not in the critical string, right? There is an extra term. So in the BRST language, the presence or the absence of an anomaly reflects into this property. Right? So if the theory is anomaly-free, then the structure constant satisfies the Jacobi identity, and then we have a BRST variation that squares to zero. If the theory does not have this property, then we will see that in the fact that the BRST, anom the BRST transformation do not square to zero. So this is just see the same concept in a different language. Right. Very good. Now, ingredient number three of the construction is addressing the question that I mentioned. What are the physical states? The physical state, let me first say it in jargon and then we explain what it means.
So the physical states are the BRST closed, but not BRST exact object. What does it mean? BRST closed, uh, it means that if you take the BRST variation of your state, you get zero. But BRST exact is something that itself is the BRST variation of something else. Now, the physical states, the non-trivial physical states, are those that are invariant under the BRST transformation, but not in the trivial way, right? If something is the BRST variation of something else, because of property two, it will be also invariant under the BRST transformation, right? So for instance, this object here is BRST exact. Of course, the variation of this guy, thanks to property two, will be zero. So physical states are states that are BRST invariant, but not of this type. Now, you may ask, is there any intuitive physical reason for defining states like that? Well, this already provides you one, right? Because the idea is that the physical states do not depend on the gauge. Right? You can change gauge, and you still have the same physical state as before. It's a gauge invariant object. Now, you see that in this formulation, since all this bit is this, the variation of gauge is sending g, my gauge condition, to g plus something. Right? It's changing this guy. Now, in the path integral, changing this guy is equivalent to insert a BRST exact deformation, right? Because you see, it's everything added, it, it's every, everything additive, right? So if you send the G in G plus delta G, you are just in, including an extra term, an extra weight, which is a BRST exact part. Right. So you want that these BRST exact things are completely irrelevant, are non-physical, right? are gauge redundancy. And the correlator that you define are independent, they do not change if you insert something that is a BRST exact term. And this property three, the BRST clause condition, ensures exactly that. Right? If, if in this correlator, you insert a state, an object, V, such that d b v is zero. Right. Then, if you change the gauge, the gauge will be some BRST variation, and the BRST variation will kill the physical object. So the extra bit will give no contribution to the correlator. Right? The, contribu the contribution will just come from the original bit. So the changing gauge means uh, including BRST exact terms. It will not change the correlations of BRST closed terms. And that's that's the reason why this formalism is, is useful. So any, okay, this is all what I want to say on the general part. And if you have seen this before, it might sound familiar. If not, what the message is that what we are doing is nothing new, is applying a formalism to the case where this gauge uh, transformation are this local uh, symmetry is the diffeomorphism in 2D. Okay, so in order to make, to, to carry out explicit calculation, uh, I will give you now the dictionary of what these objects are in our case. So the variation, the gauge variation of XM was VA 
dA xm. So that means that the BRST variation, so I do exactly what I mentioned, take the gauge variation, and then take the gauge parameter and substitute with that. So that is minus epsilon C A D A X M. Very good. So now you take, you have to calculate the gate. This I didn't do before. You can do the uh, our vector transforms under the diffeomorphism, right? And this is uh, so let, let me do this for a vector first. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, how do I call it? Uh, it. Okay, I do it for a vector v. How, how it changes this vector when I do a gauge transformation defined by V itself, right? This is what I want to do. And then I transform this V into C, and I add the one half, so I get minus C, B, D, B, C, A, plus D, B, C, A, C, B, And um, this is the BRST transformation of C. Right? Yeah, if you want, you can make this a general vector. I just didn't, I was running out of. I mean, okay, if you want, you can write this as, as C. C is a general vector, and then I say C is my, my ghost, and V will also be my ghost. So I, I, I want to define that. You can do it for a general vector, and then you can specify for uh, the vector being C. And also the gauge parameter is C. But you, please, if, if you want to check these things, uh, uh, then if there are typos in my notes, if you tell me it's very good, because then I can correct them. Right. So what I'm just say, I want just to say is that you just apply this, where now uh, um, we apply the gauge transformation is the diffeomorphism. That, that's the only information that, that, that is this relevant. And then in order to make it uh, uh, explicit, you can fix Right? If you want to make contact with the free CFT, then you, after you do this calculation, you can go back and fix it to the uh, reference metric to be flat. Right? And you can write everything in Z and Z bar coordinate. Right? And, and this is what uh, Polchinski also does. So this will be minus epsilon CZ DZ XM minus epsilon uh, C z bar, right, so this is, I don't know, c bar, d bar x, right? You just take this index, it will take two values, right, z and z bar in complex coordinate, and these are the two terms. And here you can do the same, right, you can do z, z, uh, z bar, z bar, and then you have the transformation of c and the transformation of c bar, and you can write them explicitly. Yeah? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe the, it was a bad choice to... Into, this is a completely a bookkeeping device. So, um, here. If you want, you can take it away. It's just, just for me to remind that uh, I did the variation once. 
So I, I, what I'm doing here is just applying applying this this thing, right? Yeah, uh, I think here. Yes, very good. Yes, thanks. Um, okay, let me just take one uh, ten ten seconds just to say. Sometimes, why this parameter this thing is useful, right? Because if you think that this epsilon is a fermion, then this variation is a boson, right? Because boson, boson, fermion, fermion, boson, right? So it helps you in keeping track of signs, right? When you do the second variation, right, then db will, will be a bosonic thing, and, and, you can, and you can move it a, a, around, and the signs will be all coming out from this uh, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. You can take this away and say de delta B is a fermion, and remember that every time you move uh, delta B, if you pass through a fermion, you have a sign. So, so that's, that's the only motivation there is that, 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 I, that I think. Very good. Very good. OK, so the final bit of this BRST construction that I want to mention is that once you have a new global symmetry, you can say, let me apply another theorem. And I can derive a conserved quantity. So you can, in a very standard way, derive a J BRST, which is a vector, right? So in our language, it will, it, will have, uh, it will have an index, J, A. And this is a BRST uh, current that comes out just by using these properties here on that action. So the result of this calculation, the result of the Nether procedure, is that the current takes this form. So is C times the matter stress tensor, so this X is the matter stress tensor, plus one half C times the Gauss stress tensor. And this one half comes from this one half. You can make it explicit by writing what the stress tensor for BC is. This is the lecture that we did before and simplify this term by using the fact that since c is a Grassmann number, c times c, c squared, is zero. So you can just do that algebra, and the second term simplifies, and it becomes b, c, d, c. Okay, what I'm writing here I mentioned that this J is a current, so it has an index. I'm writing JZ. Right? It's an index you are in a two-dimensional space. It has two components, right? the vector index. So I have a JZ and I have a JZ bar. Right? This is the JZ. You see it's the holomorphic bit. And this is JZ bar will be the same with bars everywhere. So this is the BRST current. Right? And as usual, from the current, you can define the charge. So people talk about BRST charge. The BRST charge is nothing else than the integral of this current. So basically, in the language of complex analysis, right, you want to take, expand this J, right, and take 
the J0, the simple pole. Okay, so if you read the Polchinski, let, let me say one thing. Uh, I will not go through this, but just to make sure that you are warned if you look at the book, right? I mentioned this is a current, so this should have conformal weight one. Right? It's like delta x. It's an object with one index. So let's check. This is minus one, this is two. So that's conformal weight one. This is two. This is minus one. The derivative is one. And c is minus one. So again, this is one. So that looks fine. That looks like, OK, that's a current. Now, you have a more precise way to check whether something is a current. You can take the OPE with the stress tensor, right? And I erase it, but we brought a few times. The OPE with the stress tensor should have a double pole. And the coefficient of the double pole should be the conformal dimension. A current is conformal dimension 1. That should be 1. And then there should not be any worse singularity than the quadratic singularity. Now, if you do this calculation, you will see that actually this is not true. If you take the OPE between the stress tensor and this J, you will find a cubic singularity. So this is not really a current. And OK, sometimes it happens when you do the Noether theorem. You get something that is conserved, but you need an improvement. So you need to add something else that keeps the object conserved, but makes it uh, uh, nice. Right. So you can add an improvement term. I will say it here, and then it never plays a role, just if you look at book that is this this again has conformal weight 2 minus 1 so that's again conformal weight 1 and this the only job of this extra term is to kill the cubic singularities when you take the OPE between T and J and that calculation between T and J you can do it by using free theory right so if you want to do it, you have all the ingredients. You know what Tx is. You know what this Tbc is. And you just contract all possible contractions. And, and, and you just check. Right. Now, why this term is, is, doesn't play much of a role in, the, in, in general? Well, if you want to calculate the uh, charge, Right? The charge is the integral of this object uh, over dz. Right? Well, this object here will never contribute because of the is, is a total derivative. Right? Yeah. The full. Very good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the, the quartic term will vanish because, because of the, we, we are already, yeah. So when you do, very good, when you do this calculation, we are doing the calculation with lambda equal to, or all the trimmings of the, uh, uh, of the uh, BC system. OK, more questions? Yeah? No, no, no. This, this C is just the ghost. Eh? It's not the central charge. So, so you're talking about this term? 
No, uh, so, uh, okay, the way I was thinking about that term was just, it was not making reference to this, right? Just stay at the end of the calculation. And I just wanted to check whether this J has conformal weight one in the standard conformal field theory sense. So what you have to calculate is T total of Z one J of Z two. Right. If this is something of conformal weight one, the first leading singularity should be Z1 minus Z2 square, one, the conformal weight, times J Z2. And in particular, there should not be any Z1 minus Z2 cube term. This should be zero. And then you have a linear term and then regular term. What I'm saying is that if you do explicitly this calculation, right? So as he was saying, you write T as the X, uh, this BC, the one for lambda equal two, you do the contraction, you actually find a cubic term like that. So if you add, so you can say, okay, let me add something that still preserves the conservation law. Conservation law is d bar j plus dj bar equals zero, right? So this is just, this is just da ja, right? Uh, if, if you write this conservation law, you want to preserve that. So I add something that is holomorphic. So when I act with d bar is zero. So I preserve the fact that it's conserved is as good as the j that comes out from the Nader theorem, but you can put this coefficient arbitrary and then you can fix it by saying you want zero there. So it is, yeah, it is not something that is very deep, it's just because if you look at the book, say, okay, why, why, why do they have this extra term? Okay, that's one reason. Very good, so let me come to the third point and finally define physical states. And then in the next hour, what I want to do is start to describe interaction among those physical states, right? So the physical states are the BRST closed, but not exact states. So how do you do calculation explicitly? What is the, the e easiest way? Take J and then by using the operator state map that we discussed at the beginning of the CFT, write the operator corresponding to your state. So B total is the full operator includes the ghost sector, everything, right, corresponding to your state. Now you calculate this OP, right, and you look at the And you look at the simple pole. This object here is the BRST variation of your state. And you immediately see that because if you want to go back to the uh, language of the charge, you have to integrate zeta one, right? And you have to integrate zeta one over the large circle, including the the V, you have to integrate the zeta one over the small circle excluding the V, you deform the contour, and so you integrate zeta one around zeta two. And so if this variation is different from zero, there is a simple pole that gives a contribution. If there is no simple pole, there is no contribution. If this is zero, then there is no contribution right, to that. 
So the charge acting on V is zero. So what I'm saying is that this CFT language of the OP provides you with a very explicit way to check point number three. Right? Take a state, write the corresponding operator. There, there are, you can do operator language, you can use commutation relation, there are other ways, but I think this is the easiest. Take a state, write the corresponding operator, take this BRST charge, BRST current, sorry, and do the OPE. If there is a simple pole, that operator or that state equivalently is not closed. If the BRST pole is zero, then that object is invariant under BRST transformation. So is there any question? On, I mean, this is kind of a key point I, I will be using in the example, but. So what, what I'm just doing is, is taking the general statement and give you an explicit uh, way of checking that statement in conformal field theory, in string theory. Okay, very good. So let me give you two statements that I will not prove. So, uh, and they are very general. I will show you examples. So my hope is that through the example, you see how it works. Uh, but giving the general proof would be a bit overkilling here. The first bit is that once you find a state that b is BRST invariant, so let, let's suppose that you find an object such as this one that has no simple pole with the current. To that object, you can add any BRST exact thing, and it will still be BRST invariant. Right? This is thanks to the property number two. So this is a kind of large generalization of gauge invariance, because in string theory now this uh, a gauge invariance is large. You have all the L's. Right? So basically it's telling you that once you have a physical state, you can take a different representative of those physical states. And the difference between two different looking representatives that are related to the same physical state has to be a BRST exact term. So mathematician would like to uh, think about this BRST variation as just a differential, like in forms. Uh, again, the differential is something like d square is equal to zero, right? And then you can define forms that are closed but not exact, right? And then you have the cohomology of the differential is the set of equivalent forms that are closed and they are equivalent because their difference is exact. So you can use the same language here. And so sometime, uh, kind of a fancy way of saying is that the physical state are the BRST cohomology of uh, are the BRST cohomology, are the cohomology of, of the BRST uh, charge, right? So are the set of all states that are closed, but the difference is exact. And any of those representatives is equally good. So in bosonic theory, uh, there is uh, uh, one statement, is that there always exists a representative that takes this, the form like that. So if you come up with any complicated physical state, a state that is BRST closed but not exact, uh, you can find a representative that is proportional to C, and all the rest depends just on the matter field. Now, there was some question at a certain point about how you link this approach to the naive quantization. That's the link, right? So in the naive quantization, you would have a restricted Hilbert space that contains only the X, 
right? And then you would find physical state as those satisfying the Gupta Bloiler conditions. Now, if you dress that solution with just a factor of C, then you would have something that doesn't have a simple pole with the BRST current, and so that's a representative of a physical state. Of course, I can take, now add here any BRST exact term and I would have another representative of the same physical state. And the second thing is that this set of states, so the states that are in the BRST cohomology, actually satisfy what we were asking for at the beginning. So they have positive norm. So what I want to do is to go through the f ground state at the first massive level. So the ground state will be quite straightforward. The first massive level, you'll start seeing uh, how this no ghost theorem work, right? So that's why I want to go through the two of them. And the first, and the first excited level, you will see which is, sorry, it's a massless thing, so the first excited level is a massless state, you will see that that provides the gauge boson and the, and the, gra the gravitons that we have. So, so let me start uh, taking the uh, simple uh, ground state. So, example one. So in the uh, state language, the ground state, uh, I mean, how do you picture a ground state of the string motion? Is a string that doesn't have any internal motion. Right? It does not rotate, it does not vibrate, right? If I want to be as ground state as possible, the string moves in a rigid fashion. So the only thing I would like to excite are the center of mass motion. And if I work as standard in QFT in momentum space, right, what I would like to say is that I have some momentum, P, that describes the motion of the string. Uh, did I call it K? Let me call it K. So some momentum K, Km, that describes the motion of the center of mass. Right. This would be the uh, um, state in the naive quantization. So this contains information only about the matter field. And then I, I do what I'm saying here, right? I dress this state with a factor of C, right? Now recall that Cz is sum of C minus Cn, Z minus N plus one. Right, so if you take C and you send Z that goes to zero, the only thing that survives is C1, right? C1 will have Z to the zero, so that's one, right? And C0 will be Z to the one, and when you take the limit Z goes to zero for getting the operator state correspondence, that term goes to zero. So C0 is killed by this, C minus one is killed by this, and so on. And C2, C3, C4 are killed because they are destruction operator, right? As we were saying. So this would be the state that is claim is a representative of a physical, a possible representative of a physical state. Now, you write the operator corresponding to this. And the operator corresponding to this is this object. Right, so you see, this object looks very similar to what you do when you write in quantum mechanics the uh, eigenstate of the momentum in configuration space, right? E to the i k x is something that has eigenvalue for the momentum k 
and is the wave function, right? So we are doing in the operator map, right? The same thing, uh, uh, similar thing happens. So this object is generated by this operator where now instead of just having the center of mass, I have to put the whole string field. So this is the operator that corresponds to that. And you can check easily that uh, uh, if you take z goes to zero, this generates this, right? When acting on the vacuum. Provided that this object, if you think about it in the, I, I will not use that language a lot, but just want to make the link. If you think about this object in the operator language, right? You want this to be normal ordered so that when it acts on the vacuum, right, the uh, creation operator, uh, the destruction operator are killed. Right? So if you think about this in operator language, this guy are normal order. And normal order is defined by saying that alpha n is a destruction operator for n bigger or equal than zero. So for the zero, I, I, I use this convention that comes convenient here. For the zero mod sector, right, for the uh, center of mass degrees of freedom, the alpha zero and the, and the uh, uh, Q, I think I call it, uh, alpha zero, which is the momentum, uh, is a destruction operator, so it has to be put on the right, and Q is uh, put on the left. Very good. So let me look at the left sector of the closed string, right? And what I want to do is to calculate C times minus alpha prime dx dx on C, this is in Z1, C e to the i k x. This is in Z2. Right? So this is the first part of the BRST charge. Right? Acting on this. I want to calculate the OPE as I was, uh, as I was advertising here. And I want to focus just on the first term. Right? I want just to focus on the simple pole. Now, you see here I have a C in Z1 and a C in Z2. So if I take the leading contribution when Z1 is equal to Z2, I get zero. Right? Because I get C Z2 times C Z2, that's a Grassmann number, so that squares to zero. So the OPE of the ghost bit is proportional to ZZ1 Z minus ZZ2 DC times C. So what I'm doing, I'm, not in, I'm doing nothing else than taking this object and do the Taylor expansion around Z2. The first term of the Taylor expansion vanishes because C is a Grassmann parameter. And so I need to take the subleading term, and this is the subleading term. Now, if I want a simple pole, right, what I need to do is to extract from all the rest the double pole. Right? If I extract from all the rest the double pole, it will cancel that and there will be a simple pole. Now, this calculation is basically a calculation of the conformal weight of this object, right? Because this thing in the parentheses is T. So is the contribution to the conformal weight coming from the X sector? Now, in this language, you can do it very easily, right? Because the double pole comes from the double, the double contraction, right? You contract this delta x with the exponential, and you contract the second delta x with the exponential. So what you get is the exponential back, 
And then the leading term in the OP, and if you go back, the leading term in the OP between delta x and x is this. So we used last time the uh, OPE between delta x and delta x. That had a factor of 2 here. Now you have to integrate that to, go b uh, to get the e OPE between delta x and x, and you easily find that the integral of 1 over z squared is 1 over z, and so you find this. You find this twice. You find this contracted with this. And this contracted with this, so you find this combination twice. Right? And every time that you contract this delta x with this x, you see this has an index m, you are getting a factor of i k. So you get i k m, i k m. And then you have, as overall factor, minus 1 over alpha prime. So you see that the simple pole of this thing is alpha prime divided by 4 and then, uh, sorry, uh, yes, alpha prime divided by 4, and then dc, c, and then I have k square e to the i k x. Right? So I cancel this with this and leave just one factor. I, I minus gives plus. This two square gives four. Alpha square cancel alpha here and just gives one alpha here. And then I write everything else. Okay, bear with me just two more minutes. Because this is half of the calculation, so we calculated the contribution coming from this term. Now we need to calculate the contribution coming from this term here. So what I need to do is one half uh, sorry, let me write it in this form to make it easier, B, C, D, C, in Z1, and then I have this, C to the I, K, X, in Z2. Now, when you calculate the OP, the matter part d does not contribute, is, is, is completely trivial. You have e to the i k x, right? And the only contribution that you get comes from this contraction between b and c. And this gives just c d c in zeta 2. I want just a simple pole z1 minus z2. So you see that the contribution coming from this term is non-zero. The contribution coming from this term is non-zero. So they are both non-trivial. And um, what you want to do is you want to cancel the two of them. 
right? The BRST closed condition is that the simple pole is zero, so you want to cancel the two of them. So let me do it, right? And you have to be careful because you see the combination here is similar, but not exactly identical to the combination of operator that you have here. Here you have DCC, and here you have CDC. So you need to swap these two objects, they are fermions, so they get a minus sign. So the total thing is uh, DC times C e to the i k x, right? So I'm using that language. So I get alpha prime to the 4 k square minus 1. Here, oh sorry, I didn't say it, but you can check that C does not have any singularity with C, right? The singularity, that, that's a good point, so I, I, or I was already taking away that term, but if you want, you can restate it back, and then you have an extra term, which is 3, 2, D, C, C, B, and, and here there is no singularity, the singularity comes from B uh, uh, contracting with C. So that's a good point. Right? So you say this is equals to zero to have a BRST closed. And now you see uh, something interesting happening. Right? Is uh, uh, something that tells you that the momentum of your string that moves rigidly cannot be arbitrary. If you want to describe a physical state, you have to satisfy this condition. So you have minus k square is equal to minus 4 over alpha prime. So again, and let me conclude with here now and then can make five minutes break. Again, what we are seeing is that there is a worksheet condition that is related to the BRST invariance, which is related to the uh, Weil invariance. Right? This worksheet condition is telling us that from the worksheet point of view, we have constraints to make physical state, consistent theory, so on and so forth. And then we interpret that constraint coming from a 2D calculation in a space-time, from a space-time point of view, because this guy looks like a non-shell equation, right? It's telling you that your, the, the k squared of your state is not arbitrary, is something. And we will link this to the mass of the state. Right. So, so this is an important point. Is it clear, right? So we did a, a, a worksheet calculation, right? You see contraction, everything was a 2D free CFT. But at the end, similar to the Weil anomaly, Right? When we interpret it as a constraint on the space-time dimension, now we interpret this as a constraint on uh, the space-time interpretation of the motion of the string. The string uh, motion has to satisfy this. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's have five minutes break. Okay, okay, so let me start again from the equation that we derived uh, in, the, in the previous lecture, right? So as I said, we want to interpret this as a space-time constraint, and uh, it's a very familiar constraint, right? So if you think about the motion of this object as a rigid motion of a string, you look at it from very far away, you see a small object almost point-like, that propagates, and it propagates in an eigenstate of the momentum. 
And so you can think about this as the definition of the mass, right? That's right. If you go to the rest frame, this k square will be the mass. Now, since we are in the mostly plus convention, so minus plus plus plus, this guy is minus k square is m square. Right? The mass comes from the k0, k0, eta 0, 0 as an extra minus, right, which cancels that minus. So you see, you see from here that the contribution coming from the Gauss system, which is not something we can change, right, was completely fixed right, by uh, all the BC construction, provides this extra term with a specific sign that tells me that this states as a negative mass square. It means that this k is a space-like vector, not a time-like vector, which means that my state is a tachyon. So this, if you wish, is an uh, unwelcome feature of bosonic string theory that still is interesting by itself, and there has been a lot of discussion uh, what happens about this instability. Attachium means that your potential, you are expanding your theory around a maximum instead of a minimum, right? A local maximum, right? You do the quadratic fluctuation, the, the mass square is the curvature of your potential, right? So people were wondering, what is the end point of this uh, singularity? Right? And if you think about this as, uh, as I'm doing in the clustering sector, so this is a clustering tachyon, people still do not know the answer of that. Um, very good. So what we can do is now consider very briefly the open string case. So this is closed tachyon. The open case right, is very similar. So in the open case, so in the closed case, what I would do is I would say, OK, I uh, have uh, independent left and right holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, 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 components. So the full vertex, which depends both on z and z bar, will just be c, c bar, e to the i, k, x. And recall that this x function z of z bar is x left plus x right. Right? So this is the closed string tachyon. The open string tachyon, I don't have to do the work from scratch. I just impose boundary condition, right? I just say, uh, I impose that uh, this guy is identified with this guy, so I put only one of them. And uh, the right component is identified with the left component with the boundary condition that I am considering. Right? So consider a DP brain. Right? And then we have that this index M splits into the Neumann direction that I called mu, the Dirichlet direction that I called i, right? And the identification is that x right, the oscillator of the right part are identical to the oscillator of the left part for the Neumann direction, and they are opposite for the Dirichlet direction. So the open string tachyon would be c time e to the i k mu x mu, right? From here, the Dirichlet direction will cancel out. So this matches with the picture that we have that the open string can move only in the Neumann direction, right? It cannot move, so this 
plane is the collection of all the Neumann direction, x0 is among them, and then xi, the Dirichlet direction, are the orthogonal one, the string can fluctuate, but there is no drift motion, there is no center of mass motion of the string in the Dirichlet direction because the endpoints are stuck and they cannot move. So this is the condition, and what happens is that along the Neumann direction, right, these two things will sum up. So if you write the vertex in terms of the left thing, you will have an extra factor of two. Right? Just because alpha tilde is equal alpha, you sum them up. So you repeat the same calculation, right? This is everything stays the same. The only difference is that instead of k here, you get 2k. And instead of getting k square as the scalar product over all space-time dimension, you get the scalar product only along the Neumann direction. So the on-shell condition will be uh, minus 2 k mu, 2 k mu equal minus 4 over alpha prime. Right? So I write the same thing as here. Every time I see k, I write 2k, and I restrict the Lorentz indices to the Neumann sector. So you see that the open string tachyon is still a tachyon, so this, the problem of the sign I is there. It's just the numbers are slightly different. So this is the mass of the closed tachyon. This is the mass square of the open tachyon. Is 1 over alpha prime. Now, this different normalization will be again related to this uh, property of the different slope of the rigid trajectory that we saw in the classical theory. So now we are starting seeing the first discrete states in the quantum theory. So the open string tachyon vertex is a physical vertex, we would describe like that. But very importantly, I want to add in the open string case an extra bit of information that is about the endpoints. Right? I want always you to think about the open string as supported by these uh, um, extended objects that are called the DP brains. right? You cannot have an open string with endpoints hanging loose. They have to be supported by this DP brain. And so what I want to do is to add a bookkeeping device that tells me what brain is supporting the first endpoint and what brain is supporting the second endpoint. So I write this as T I J. Right. So think about that as a matrix. Well, this index i runs over all possible brains. And this index j, the same, runs over all possible brains. But this index i is the first sigma equals zero endpoint. And this one downstairs is the second endpoint. So in this picture is a bit redundant because if I say I have only one D brain, then I is equal to J. Right. I have only one D brain, the first endpoint and the second endpoint must end on the only possible supporting thing. So I would have T11. If you had two D brains, and this will play a crucial role also in your ADS-CFT lectures, right? you will have many copies of the same state that will have the same CFT description but different matrices because they, the, those states start and end on different D brains. How many states do you have? Well, you have four of them. The first and the second endpoint starting and ending on the same brain. The first and the second are again ending on the same brain, but the other one. And then you have the first 
adding on the first one and the second on the second one, and the other way around. So this T, think about it as a square matrix that is n by n, where n is the number of the possible D brain, the possible supporting object that you have, the number of DD brains. So how many do you have? Well, you have n square object, right? n equal to, you see, 2 square 4. So the difference between close and open string, on the CFT side, just the identification. And on the top, the vertex operator has this extra degrees of freedom that tell me where the open string are ending. In the old language, this guy is called Champaton factor, this matrix here. Very good. Any questions? Now, let me say very briefly, don't ask too many questions on this. If you have questions, then come to me. Even better, we can ask Carlo. Um, uh, if you really pay close attention, you will see that it's not that difficult to write a strict cousin of this state that looks to have all the same con properties as this one. And this strict cousin, let me write it in green, and then is to add here an extra C0. In the vertex language, is adding an extra DC here. And you see that this DC has an object of conformal weight 0, because C has conformal weight minus 1, the derivative has conformal weight 1. So it looks like you are dressing your state with something that doesn't affect too much the things. Now, you want to kill those states. So if you want to be precise, and this is uh, important for certain applications, right, you will say that your physical state satisfy an extra condition that is B0 on the physical state equals zero, right? This condition is satisfied for this state, right? Because B0 anti-commutes with C1, and then you remember B minus one, B0, B1, B2, B3, they were all destruction operators, so they will kill it, right? But it will not be satisfied for that. Very good. So this is just to say that if you have the temptation of dress your physical state in this form, that's killed by this gauge condition here. Very good. So let me now do in some detail. So this was kind of a trivial example, but OK, it gives you the idea. Worship constraint reinterpreted in space time. Now, let me do the calculation for the uh, first uh, massive level. right? And there you start seeing. Uh, many interesting uh, feature, including how this no ghost theorem works. So you can start from your ground state, right? This is if this is like the left part. Let me do now the open string if you want, right? This is the open string vertex, the open string state, right? And then I. In order to uh, go to excited states, I, I, I add some vibration. Right? And I add all possible vibration I can do. Of course, if I add vibration that are very violent, then I have a very excited state. So to do things step by step, let me add only the vibration that have mode 1. So I can add alpha minus 1 m, epsilon m. Then I can add, and let me see how I call it, 
gamma c minus 1. And then I can add beta b minus 1. Right? This is called level 1. Right? Just because is dressed is dressed in the tachyon with oscillator that oscillate in the first harmonic. How many states do you have? 28. Right? One, two, and then this epsilon is a vector that is a 26-dimensional vector, and I can choose it, the component completely in a completely arbitrary way. So I have 28 vectors. Now, you have to take this and calculate the BRST variation. So I'll do the same calculation that I did uh, for the tachyon. Right? And then you want to impose that there is no simple pole. So let me tell you what the answer is. Of these 28 states, there will be two that are unphysical. So two of these 28 states will give a simple pole in the correlation between J and uh, the vertex, whatever K is. There is no condition that saves you. Two of these states are BRST exact. So it's true that they don't give any simple pole, but they, they themselves can be written as Q of something else. And 24 states are physical. Now, the analog of the condition that you have there on K to make these states physical is K squared equals zero. So, the first excited state, the first excited level, describes massless states. So I will not do, I, I mean, I, I have it here, but uh, I, I will not do all the steps. You, you, it's not more complicated than the one I just did before for the tech, you know, right? So. You, you, can, you can do them. But uh, I just want to give you the results, so if you want to fill the, the steps, then you, you know where you should land. So, uh, and I give you a characterization of what uh, these states are. So, the uh, action that you get, the, the result that you get by looking at the simple pole uh, of this object will, contain, will be non-zero, for this term, so the result after BRST, so Q BRST on this, C1, K0, this guy will be equal to C minus one C one epsilon dot K plus beta C one alpha one K. Right. So you see that if you make this guy different from zero, right, then there is a term after the BRST variation that is non zero. 
So that's, the def that's one of these two. It's telling you that the state that you generate in this way is not part of the physical spectrum. You have to take it away. The other state that is non-vanishing is a particular combination of this polarization. And let me a bit, uh, be a bit more explicit for that. Right? So this polarization epsilon in space-time, you can divide the space-time into the light con of this state and the bit that are transverse to the light con. So you can write these 26 states in terms of objects that are orthogonal to, that are space-like, right? And then a term that is proportional to k and a term that is proportional to k bar. k and k bar are null vectors, right? k square and k bar square are zero. k is the momentum of the state. And k bar is a null vector such that k times k bar is 1. So if you want, is the other independent null vector. Right. So the picture, this should probably be very familiar from special relativity. Right. So if you have like on, this is your k, this is your k bar, and all the other directions are orthogonal to the like on. Now, you see that this condition, you want epsilon dot k equals zero, it kills this possibility, right? Because if epsilon is proportional to k bar, then you have k bar times k, that's one. And you want to kill this term because this term appears in the BRST variation as a non-trivial term. Yeah? Yeah, so is this picture clear, right? So what I'm saying is that look at the, from the point of view of your state, this state is defined by a null vector, which is the momentum. So that, that's on a Lycon, k square. Now the Lycon is two-dimensional, so I have an independent vector, and I call that independent vector k bar. So if you really want to be super explicit, you can go to a frame where k is e, 0, 0, 0, e, Right? And k bar is e zero 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 minus e. Right? This then you have this is uh, zero k square is zero, this k square is zero, but k k bar is okay now two e. Right? You can normalize if you want to have it one. Right? This is k and k bar. And then you have all the epsilon i are this twenty four direction. Now, if you choose any epsilon i, of course, it will be, will be, will be orthogonal to k. Right? So this term is not there. If you choose epsilon equal k, OK, here you will have k square. So that's still fine. It's BRST closed. But if you choose epsilon equal k bar, this is violated. So this tells you what the, the two unphysical states are. The one generated by b minus 1 and the one generated by k. Is this clear? Now, the very same calculation, you can read it in another way. So bear with me, because this is just a conceptual bit. You can say, what are the exact states? The exact states are those that I can add right, to my my, my vector, just to get my state, just to get a different representative. And those, those are gauge trivial. Right. Now, this object here, this state here, by itself, is exact, because it's the Q of something else. Right. So, the terms which has C1, which is this one, sorry, this, this one, the terms that has, oh, let, let, do both. let me start from here, the terms that is C minus one, which is this one, this is a BRSD exact term. 
I can rewrite this term as Q acting on something else, right? And that something else is exactly the unphysical object that I throw away. Right? So if I, if I start acting on Q on an object where the polarization is K bar, I get K bar K, that's one. I get C minus one, C one. That, that's this, C minus one, C one. I don't care that the original thing I acting on is unphysical, right? This is irrelevant, right? It's just a way to generate a BRST exact thing. So I'm telling you of these 28 states, what are the BRST exact? This one is BRST exact. So if I switch off everything else, and I just keep that, that's just like saying the vacuum. It's not, it's not a, it's not a non-trivial physical state. You plug it in some correlator of physical state and it will, that correlator will be zero. What is the other BRST exact term? Well, you read it from here. It's the one that has alpha minus one and has a particular polarization, K. So, is this one. One, so of this 26, one we threw away, 25. Of the remaining 25, when epsilon is proportional to k, that's, that's an exact, right? If I write here k, I can see this term as the BRST variation of something. So these are the two BRST exact terms. So notice that what are the, 20, the 24 that survives? Well, the 24 that survives are the epsilons that have a non-trivial entry in the space-like component. Right? We kill the K bar, we kill the K, so the only thing that survives are epsilon that are non-trivial in 1, 2, 3, 4, and D minus 1. Uh, sorry, D minus 2 here. So you see that the 24 surviving states have positive norm. Now, what's happening here at the first level always happens. Right? You will have a physical state, BRST exact, and then when you go to the cohomology, you will be left with, uh, uh, with this. Let me make an extra comment uh, it's a very nice comment that you find in, book, in the book by Polchinski. Um, that is, uh, you read again from this, uh, from this uh, variation, right? So what he's suggesting is that this variation is calculated by acting on this object with the BRST charge of the worksheet theory. So this is the thing that is still written in the blackboard with the worksheet ghost, worksheet stress tensor, right? Uh, is everything is a two-dimensional calculation. The green functions, uh, the, the OPE are those in 2D, right? This is a 2D calculation. But the result of this calculation looks exactly as what you would get if you uh, interpret this as a space-time BRST variation where the space-time symmetry is the gauge symmetry. So in space-time, right, you have here a massless vector, massless vector as a gauge symmetry, epsilon that goes in epsilon plus k, right, so you can address even QED, even the U1 uh, uh, case in the BRST formula is a bit overkilling, but you can do that, right? And then you can say what are the BRST variation with the BRST, the space-time BRST, right? And then you would say, well, the space-time BRST, the space-time of A mu is C K mu, right? The, the space-time of the B field is big B, 
And then when you integrate this big B that I mentioned, you get the gauge condition. So this is Ka. So this is just the gauge condition. Now, this is the space-time. Now, if you look at this uh, combination here, you see that the variation of B minus 1 is signaled by this beta, right, is K dot the vector. And this is exactly the space-time variation of the space-time B ghost. So this B is not this B. This is the space-time and this is the space-time. Right, so these are the BC of the father Popov that you find in the Feynman diagrams, right? So it's, it's space-time Feynman diagrams, right? So it's basically telling you that the states generated by the worship ghost are the states that in the Feynman diagram you draw with the dots, the propagation of the ghost. And the same here, you see the variation of A the variation of A is C times K, right? So here you have K, and here you have C. So this guy look like the B space time, and this guy look like B space time, and this guy look like C space time. So there is an identification <laughs> of the BRST, the action of the BRST charge on the worksheet and the action of the space-time BRST charge. So I'm concluding this lecture by, th this is a very important point, by uh, stressing that what we are deriving for free, right, it was not an input, is that the physical state and the properties of the physical state in this theory look exactly like those of a gauge vector in space-time. You have the right uh, massless condition, uh, k square equals zero, uh, this one. You have the right number of degrees of freedom, d minus two. These objects have the gauge invariance of the uh, space-time. In space-time is epsilon that goes in epsilon plus k. That plus k is a BRST exact term that you can add to get an equivalent representative. And even the action of the BRST charge reproduces the action of the space-time BRST charge. Right. So what you are obtaining in the open string is a set of n-square massless vectors, where these massless vectors have a symmetry, at least in, in the free theory, and it will be okay, cannot do today, but next time we'll do the interaction theory, we'll see that this carries over the interaction theory. So they have a symmetry that is exactly the gauge symmetry. So this is uh, uh, providing you with the uh, first uh, thing I'd advertise that uh, uh, string theory automatically give rise to gauge theories. Which gauge theory are you getting here? Well, it's a gauge theory of n square gauge bosons. So this will be the UN gauge theory, right? Uh, where you have N square uh, possible gauge boson. Okay, so I'll stop here. Next time I will first describe a bit a formalism for the physical state that is called uh, DDF states. Uh, and then I will move to the interaction and then to the super string. But are there any questions on this part? Yeah, please. Very good question. I was trying to hide that, but okay, now you have to bear like one more minute to answer this. That's a very good question because the number of physical state is always 24. I, I just prove it, right? I can choose this epsilon anywhere. But as he is saying, because of this identification, the momentum lives only in p plus one direction. Right? The direction, the number of direction, uh, where I impose Neumann boundary condition on this D brain, right? Now, then what do I have? I have 
24 states then propagate in p plus 1 direction. Let me call this p plus 1 small d. That small d is the space-time of the gauge theory. So you will actually need to see, and this is important for the RDS-CFT uh, lecture, these 24 states to, divi to be divided in two groups. Uh, small d minus 2 are the physical uh, degrees of freedom of a vector that lives in a small d dimensional theory. And the remaining d minus parentheses p plus 1, uh, so uh, in uh, the, 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 those remaining objects, will be massless scalar, right? Because from the point of view of the residual uh, Poincare group, they do not transform under the Lorentz transformation and the shifts that are along the Neumann direction. So the full original space-time symmetry splits into SO1, P and then SO D minus P plus 1, right, where D is 26 in, in bosonic theory and 10 in, in superstring, as we will be seeing. So uh, this, uh, when this polarization epsilon here is along the transverse Dirichlet direction, is still a massless state, is still a physical state, but is a state that is a scalar from the point of view of this group, and it transforms in the fundamental representation of this residual rotation. And in the theories you will be looking at, this residual rotation will be the R symmetry that maybe you have seen in the in the, in the supersymmetric theory, right? That's a geometric realization of the R-symmetry. So this is the beginning of something that I will try and emphasize more and more. This D-brain construction gives you really a geometric uh, realization of some abstract concept that you see in, 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 uh, in QFT, right? So you see really the groups, the symmetries, the, uh, the R-symmetry, the, uh, will be really actual physical objects that are there. Okay, more questions? Okay, so very good. Thank you.